Hello, I'm Theolyn Cortans and this is a Signs and Wonders video. I'm going to show you something special that I keep on my bookcase and it was the inspiration for what I want to talk about today. Here it is. Look, it's a little box with an angel. Angel playing a harp. Isn't she exquisite? Look at her lovely wings. Bring them in close. And then if I pull her out again, you can see the whole one. And if I bring her close again, you can see her tiny little hands playing the delicate strings. And she is definitely female. I'm swiddling her around. So there you go. You can see her bosom. Um, and overall, she is very beautiful. She's got diamonds and gold and she's very precious. Now, the reason when I spotted her originally, quite a few years ago now, that um, I wanted to put her on my bookshelf was because she reminded me of the Ark of the Covenant. Now, the Ark of the Covenant has actually got two angels. Well, they are cherubim, actually. And if you've ever seen Indiana Jones, The Search for the Lost Ark, you may well know the picture of the Ark and what it looks like with its two cherubim and its poles for carrying. So it's a very large box that would have been carried possibly by four people. And um, the story of it is very ancient and very mysterious. So our briefly run through that story because the most important thing about the Ark of the Covenant really is to do with the symbolism of the Ark, not so much the actual physical item. Now, you may know this story, but let me remind you, the uh, Israelites have managed to escape from the wicked Pharaoh and Moses is leading them across the desert and they have a 40-year journey, although, of course, they've got no idea how long it's going to take when they set off. Moses, wanting to guide them, inspire them, and keep them on track, from a spiritual perspective, he goes up the mountain on a regular basis to chat with God, and he opens himself to receiving wisdom. He becomes a channel, we could say. So I use the word chat, but that's a bit lighthearted, really, for something that's so significant and important for the Israelites at the time. And if you think about it, the Ten Commandments are a significant um, document, which is still present for the world today. And even if you are not Jewish or Christian or, or even Muslim, those commandments are kind of embedded in our culture, some of the basic essentials of loving God and not, not killing and you know, not committing adultery. And many, many of those precepts are accepted by secular people. So Moses comes down from the mountain with these commandments written on stone tablets, we're told. We don't know what the stone was made of. I've often wondered whether it was something like lapis lazuli, but they are big enough for him to break when he's cross because he gets very, very cross when he discovers that the Israelites down below have just been doing things that are kind of to do with the old religion. They've been making a golden calf. They collected all the jewels and the gold from all 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 the people, especially the women, gave their jewellery and it was all melted down to make a new idol. And that was one of the forbidden commandments. You don't make idols and you don't worship any god except the one god. So Moses smashes the um, stones and then after he's had his tantrum and his very understandable temper he goes back to God and says oh, I think I've got to do this again so he comes down with a second edition and that has to be treasured so then they make the Ark of the Covenant and 
it doesn't say in detail, but we can assume that all the gold that was used for this golden calf is repurposed because the Ark of the Covenant uses a lot of gold in its construction. So then the tablets are kept in this box, in, in, in this travelling box, because while they're travelling, the um, Israelites are stopping and continuing their rituals and their observances. And so they have a, a portable tabernacle. And the Ark of the Covenant is kept in the tabernacle behind a veil in an area called the Holy of Holies. And only the priests can go in and touch it. And if the wrong people touch the Ark of the Covenant, they might get a nasty shock. It sounds like an electrical shock that they might get. And that has made some people suggest that this was some kind of advanced technology, this box. Obviously, we don't know. We can't say anything much about it because we don't know where it is now. Um, the legend tells us, the history of the Jewish people tell us, that um, the Ark did survive that trek and that it was kept for many generations within the temple. And there's a certain point when the temple's destroyed, when the Ark of the Covenant and some of the other treasures disappear. And today, to this very day, Jewish group in Ethiopia, Ethiopian Jews, claim that they have got it. And it's protected by a priest who dedicates his whole life to being with it. He's, he's the servant of it. No one else can look at it. And one of the things that's said in, in a book by uh, Graham Hancock, who went looking for it, is that um, the priest who guards it um, always seems to suffer from a particular ailment of cataracts in the eyes. That, you know, eventually, after many years of being with this ark, he develops these cataracts and he goes blind. They, the Ethiopian Jews, carry an ark around the town where this is kept on a, a ceremonial basis but the ark is a copy they they tell everybody this is a copy of the real thing which we're not going to let you see because it's kept secretly in this tiny little chapel kind of place and nobody nobody is allowed in except that priest so it's a very, very mysterious object, this ark, with this very ancient history. And nobody can really say for certain what exactly is involved, except that it's regarded as sacred. Now, if you go to a Jewish um, ceremony, a Jewish Shabbat um, event, there is a point when um, an ark, a wooden, like a wooden cupboard almost, is opened during the service and the rabbi will take out the Torah, which is like a scroll, and he'll bring it out to the bima, spread it out to read the Torah portion. So this happens every time there's a Sabbath service. Now, I just share with you an experience I had with that because I wasn't brought up in a Jewish family but many years ago now I went to um, a service a, a, a Sabbath service in, in I was living in Oxford at the time and it, this was a liberal service it wasn't an orthodox service but they do the same thing they open the ark which is as I say usually like a big wooden wardrobe almost and this particular service, because they were liberals and they didn't have a big fancy synagogue of their own, was being held in like a rather cheap, you know, like a uh, an environment like a uh, church hall or, you know, or a school hall. There were just ordinary chairs and benches and it was not decorated at all. It wasn't a special, didn't feel like a special sacred place. But I was quite close to the front, it was quite a small area, and the, the rabbi, again he was not orthodox, so he didn't have the long beard and the long hair, he, he was um, the, the long ringlets, 
So he was fairly conventional in his appearance and his dress, apart from his little kipper. And when he opened the ark, which was just like a carved cupboard to take out the Torah, I felt the most immense goose pimply experience. It was quite shocking to me. It was quite, oh, like that. And I wasn't expecting it because I, I hadn't gone into a room or a, a temple or a church or, or, or any kind of spiritual place. The only sacred thing that was going on was the opening of this cupboard. Now, as I say, I wasn't brought up in a Jewish family and as far as I know, I don't have... Jewish ancestors I, I can't tell so whether that's a, a, a sort of past life recognition of, of a spiritual activity or what it was I don't know except that he had a very profound effect on me and it wasn't as I say it wasn't even accompanied by sacred music or or anything there was obviously some Hebrew being spoken but it was the opening of the door and seeing the Torah wrapped in its velvet inside. And it, even now while I'm talking about it, it gives me goose pimples. So let's have a think about what that means from a spiritual perspective. Why an ark or a mysterious box or a mysterious cupboard or container has a profound... Um, effect on our vibrations in some way perhaps. So many years later, many years after that, I was channeling the um, wisdom that you can find in the angel script and I was being presented through the writing of the angels and you can find out more about that on the website. I was being presented by this series of symbols or characters that relate to Hebrew. <clears throat> and, <clears throat> and this is the angel script. Um, and one of the symbols that I was presented with was this one. Right. And, the f you know, the inspiration that came when I saw it was that this was to be called the Ark. And you can see why. It's like a box with four orbs of light and that inspiration from that gave me the channeled uh, the channeled uh, reading which um, which says the ark is an empty container it sits in the temple waiting for the divine and then it goes on to say when every space is filled with our own thoughts and measurements there is no place for the divine to filter into our lives. Therefore, we need to keep an ark ready and waiting as a sign of our purpose to always allow the divine flame a space in our lives. And the reference to the divine flame is, of course, because in, in a Jewish <coughs> synagogue, there will always be an eternal flame burning as recognition that the divine is ever present. So that's um, what perhaps enough that I can say today about the Ark of the Covenant and how it symbolizes a space. It doesn't have to be in a building. It doesn't have to be in a church hall or a synagogue or you know a cathedral or, or a mosque. It doesn't have to be in one of those buildings, which of course, as I'm recording this um, during the pandemic, are, are buildings that are a great deal closed to most people. So the ark is something in your heart, in your, well, in your whole being, in your mind, in your heart, in, in every part of you. The ark is a special quiet place. And you find that during deep meditation. So let me once again encourage you 
to take up your meditation practice and give space, give, um, create an arc for yourself, a little space within you. If you can find a little space in your house that you keep as a quiet place, that would be wonderful. But that quiet arc is in you wherever you go. If you present it to the divine and say, I am keeping a space for you in my heart. Many, many blessings and keep shining.